uh, the recent death within the last week of uh, Queen Elizabeth II actually got me thinking about a couple of things. Her 70 year reign and some enormous differences in the world from before she started in the immediate post-war years uh, to where we are today. One of those differences is that countries, companies, people are far more interconnected today than not only than back then in the immediate post-war years, but than ever before. And one of the interesting things about the interconnectedness is that when company when countries engage with each other, both diplomatically as well as uh, economically in trading, including engaging in both those ways with your potential enemies, it actually has a, uh, an effect of helping keep the peace because you're not gonna be going to war with somebody who might be a critical supplier or a critical customer of yours. And as long as you engage in diplomacy, it keeps you talking and it tends to keep the peace. And that has been the basis of what has been, at least on a global scale, not, not involving every individual country, but on a, on a large scale, it's been a key ingredient of keeping the world away from World War III in all the years since World War II. Such a system can develop holes in it and can start to fall apart if a key player suddenly decides that they wanna go after some advantage in an inappropriate way or go after something that's not theirs. And uh, to cut through all that, I think you can all see that what I'm talking about is uh, the reason recent six plus months ago decision of Russia, Vladimir Putin, to go after Ukraine and to do it in a, in a brutal, vicious, aggressive way that we haven't seen since the end of World War II. And that's caused a whole range of ripple effects. It, it took, among other things, what was already a brewing and growing energy crisis and has accelerated it. It has taken countries that had been dealing with each other, even potential enemies, but dealing with each other in an open and above board way. And they're suddenly at loggerheads with each other. It's caused the US as well as all the countries of Western Europe to implement some pretty significant uh, sanctions against Russia. And as I observed in an earlier meeting that we had some months ago, economic sanctions among other things, can, are a way of dealing with things without going to open war among countries. But economic sanctions do have a price, not just to the, company, the country that's being sanctioned, but to the countries that are applying those sanctions. And we're certainly seeing that uh, with a number of ripple effects uh, throughout the world, ripple effects from the Ukraine war. So we're seeing, uh, a large number of shocks in energy pricing. And those shocks are starting themselves are starting to have ripple effects around the world. And it's all aspects of energy. It's electricity, it's, it's, uh, it's coal-based energy, it's oil-based, natural gas, even nuclear, and which might strike some of you as a little unusual, but we'll probably hear some comments from uh, David on that subject as well. So, some pretty dramatic things going on in the energy arena. Those dramatic things are having ripple effects. They're having effects on from countries to companies. And we may start to see company failures with the, with the huge increase in energy pricing that we're seeing. So we're about to hear a lot of really interesting things. Let me give a, uh, some brief introduction of, of our speaker, David Edick, who has spoken to us several times in the past. Uh, twice just in just over the past year uh, on a few interesting subjects. Most recently, some of you may remember in, uh, I think it was April, David spoke to us on the, the global ripple effects of the war in Ukraine, which at the time was new. And it's now been going on over six months. And we're certainly seeing some of those things. Uh, I remember David at the time mentioned that we're gonna be seeing a global food shortage which to me was an eye opener. And, and we're, we have been seeing that 
uh, a global energy crisis, which we are certainly seeing, and he'll be speaking about that today. Uh, David is, uh, let me just look at my notes here on, on uh, some things I wanted to say about David. David is the uh, founder and principal at Core Global Advisory, uh, a consulting firm that looks at political risk, commodities, um, market strategy, and global political strategy. Uh, David has a huge amount of experience in commodities, in global trade, in uh, political impacts of economic events around the world. And uh, David has, his experience has included uh, working in Mexico, working in Russia, he speaks fluent Russian. So that means I guess if uh, David, if you were ever a fly on the wall in a, in a meeting in, in uh, Vladimir Putin's office, you'd have some interesting things you could tell us. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well said, David. I, I assume. I, I don't know. You know, I, I finally, uh, some years ago, I finally was able to learn the, the, the meaning of the letters KGB and was able to actually say what the words were. And then what do you know? Well, the Soviet Union dissolved and the KGB, at least in theory, doesn't exist uh, anymore. But uh, David is uh, is active in a number of different things. He's a, he's a member of the uh, the Energy Conference for the Res the Western Regional Partnership, which is a, a group consisting of the federal government, state governments, and uh, uh, Indian tribes, uh, Native American tribes, in a half dozen Western states. David has been active uh, for a number of years with several other groups. He was the uh, three-term chair of the San Diego World Affairs Council. He was the six-term uh, chair of the San Diego uh, Sister Cities Program and was instrumental, was the key player in getting the uh, Sister Cities Program up and running between San Diego and Vladivostok in uh, the Soviet Union now in Russia. Uh, let me think what other critical things I wanted to mention here. There's a number of other things I could, I could tell you about David, just some great experience and uh, which, has, which has given him over the years some great insights into things. Uh, David's a graduate of San Diego State University in a, a kind of a tailored degree that he uh, structured in the area of political economy. And David lives out, in, uh, out near El Cajon, which means that in the last couple of weeks, he has managed to feel the full brunt of the 100 plus degree temperatures that we've had in Eastern San Diego County. Uh, so without any further ado, David, let me turn it over to you. Dan, thank you very much. It's great to be here again, everybody. Uh, so, so fascinating that uh, one year ago, plus one day, I was here to talk about the emerging uh, crisis in natural gas in Europe. It was long before the war uh, erupted in Ukraine, before Russia's invasion. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and move into things. Give me a moment. Can you see this? Yeah, it's not a slideshow. So Yep, I'll get there. Yeah. yeah, I had a little hiccup there. Okay. There you go. All right. <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to be here again with uh, uh, the San Diego chapter of Thang. Uh, it's always a good group of people, good questions. And these are interesting times. Uh, certainly what was going on a year ago set the stage for where we are now. It was already an historic time in the world of, of energy and, and Europe and spreading really worldwide. Uh, and since then, of course, uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine uh, February 24th, uh, earlier in this year. Now, this, this took place against a, a complicated backdrop geopolitically. Uh, uh, this has been coming for a while. Uh, some would say that uh, that the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, goes back to 2014. Uh, and I think there's a lot to that. Uh, 
but beyond that, uh, the end of the, the Cold War, uh, coming to terms with that, the, uh, the end of uh, America's unipolar moment, uh, and the challenges of really what is a multipolar world, a transition from what was to what will be, and we're still working on what that's going to be. So this is this is a the, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and all the consequences of it are are big, important, uh, and there's more to come. Uh, this is uh, a, certainly a fascinating situation, uh, and it will get scary, I'm afraid, before it's all said and done, and we haven't even started talking about uh, China, U.S. Uh, East Asia relations. So time is a factor. I've got a bunch of slides here. Uh, if you want them, the slide deck could be available either from me or through uh, Charlotte or, or through uh, Dan Ruckman. But let's go. So yeah, narrow this down here a little bit so I can see. Okay, so indeed, you know, Everyone on this call is aware of a uh, shocking explosion, uh, an historic explosion in the price of energy in Europe. Looking here at a, at a chart for natural gas, I want to draw your attention to number one coming over here. You can already see that there was a, a dramatic scene in European energy circles when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, in the months since then, it's been really a never-ending drama, most recently uh, uh, with the uh, staged closure of the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which was really the backbone flow from Russia to Europe. And prices peaked out here, uh, say, about uh, a week or so ago. Uh, $100 uh, per million uh, BTU. Uh, and then in, in, uh, Henry Hub is, you know, roughly the eight, nine dollars thereabouts. I haven't checked here uh, recently. Now, this price here is, is backed off into the to, to the upper 50s. But still, if you're looking at $60, that is still a, a, a shocking price. In this presentation, I am going to talk about uh, natural gas in Europe. That's kind of the has been the focal point of the, the crisis. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the Repower EU, uh, which was the European Union's uh, plan essentially to de-Russify. Uh, let's just be clear that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, is open warfare. The sanctions uh, from the West are open economic warfare, and the Russians have responded in recent months to that. Uh, it used to be the idea with sanctions were kind of a soft way to conduct a conflict or coerce uh, an entity or an actor into different action. This is hardball of the first order, and the consequences are global. I'll talk uh, about the energy shock, not just gas, but uh, electricity. Talk about the energy company financial turbulence, uh, the consequence of hedging in an extraordinary volatile environment. Talk about the economic impacts uh, and the deindustrialization that, in fact, uh, much of Europe faces uh, in the years to come as a result of these soaring energy prices uh, that are going to be around for a while. I'll talk a little bit about the forthcoming sanctions on Russian oil and oil products and the potential for a price cap and uh, a few takeaways at the end. So looking at Europe, uh, the, the on the right here, the this is primary energy in use in Europe. Oil is primarily for transportation. Gas is split three ways between, uh, say, uh, residential and municipal heating. Uh, electricity generation is another third. And then industrial uses, say, things like fertilizer manufacturing or petrochemicals, uh, et cetera. Coal has uh, been a fading part of the European energy profile. Uh, 
uh, until this last year, uh, and coal is getting a rebirth, a uh, rather extraordinary rebirth uh, to, the, to the degree that Europe can change directions uh, in a hurry. Uh, renewables uh, have a significant place in the European flow. Uh, it's, it's electricity as is nuclear power, which has been fading. Both of these are controversial topics, let's say, and nobody talks about hydro, but in terms of the Russian thing that affects oil, gas, and coal. Europe is on the chart on the left, whoops, sorry, the chart on the left. Europe is uh, uh, one of the second largest consumer in the world. Uh, is a modest producer. Russia is a heavily gasified economy. About 60% of Russia's primary energy is from natural gas. Uh, so what they don't sell abroad, they can use at home uh, or keep in the ground. Um, point out uh, Norway and Qatar major producers are also major LNG export, uh, excuse me, Norway is a pipeline. Uh, major exporter to Europe. Australia is a major LNG producer worldwide, as is Qatar, uh, vying with the US, which is pulled into the lead in terms of global LNG production. But uh, Australia and Qatar are major players in LNG, and Norway is also a major player in pipeline natural gas to Europe. As I mentioned, uh, in, in Europe, gas is used roughly a third for electric power, roughly a third for buildings, transportation, you know, you know, the heating, you know, residential, et cetera, and then the industrial. Uh, an important factor uh, in use for natural gas in Europe, since heating is an important component of it, you have winter demand surges every year. And that's really the purpose for storage in Europe is to uh, handle the, the seasonal surge. This is a challenge for uh, you know, removing Russia from the gas supply equation. We've just gone through the summer months where if Russia is not sending any gas to Europe here in June, July, and August, it's not really a big deal. It is a big deal in the winter. And uh, these flows uh, are before uh, storage flows. So if Russia is not part of the picture this winter, uh, Europe will be depending a great deal on storage and uh, expanded LNG exports. And an important factor to consider about storage is that you can, you can only pull it so fast. If you have it in... Uh, uh, caverns, you can uh, take it out rather quickly. But if it's stored in old gas fields or in aquifers, it's much slower and you, you, you can only do what you can do. Looking back at the history, uh, there's a lot of talk, especially in uh, Anglo-American circles, that, uh, that Europe uh, was asleep at the wheel. Geopolitically, you know, you should never depend on the Russians for uh, gas. Well, it was a two generation uh, project. Back in the beginning, when Europe began to use natural gas in the mid to late uh, 60s, you can see here this chart running from 1970 to 2020. This red line applies to this part of the graphic on the right. In those early days of the 1960s and the 1970s, Europe's natural gas supply was uh, fulfilled almost entirely from a supergiant field at Groningen in northeastern uh, Netherlands. It is one of the largest gas fields ever discovered in the world, uh, a bit heavy on nitrogen, uh, but nevertheless, uh, became the backbone of Europe's gasification in leaving coal behind in terms of industry and, and uh, being able to uh, expand use uh, access to energy that was easily uh, was mobile. As demand in Europe expanded, supply no longer met that 
demand. And it's starting in 1966 and growing uh, over the decade following, 15 years or so following, pipelines were built from the Soviet Union across Comic-Con Eastern Europe, uh, Soviet zone Eastern Europe into Western Europe, Germany in particular, and Austria was the, the channel, if you will, the, that neutral country, the neutral zone of uh, connection between East and West. However, over the years, the percentage of gas that Europe got domestically, locally faded. And this includes the great discoveries in the North Sea, which caused some momentary plateauing. This orange includes flows from Russia and Norway and elsewhere. Let's take a look. So looking back over the last decade or so, you can see the fading in, in Europe. Uh, you can see the significant role played by Norway, Africa, primarily Algeria. You can see the role of Russia, hardly a monopoly situation, but very, very important. And you can see the role of LNG, uh, which in the last year has soared, has ballooned in importance. And here in the last year, you can see Russia's uh, market share in Europe has fallen dramatically. Uh, while Nord Stream 1 is now closed, well, I'll talk pipelines in a moment. Um, the, the big story of the last year has been the expansion of uh, Europe's uh, importation of LNG uh, from the United States in particular, uh, but drawing essentially uh, impacting the entire global market for that commodity. Rus uh, Europe has got money and they have pulled out their wallet and they are using it and they will outbid anybody uh, and they are in the market big time against the Japanese and the Chinese and Asia. Uh, complex map showing the pipeline flows in from Norway. Nord Stream 2 was pressurized, was never turned on. I cannot foresee it any time in the next decade or even longer. All the shareholders and Western investors have written off their holdings. So even, it could, even though it could be running in you know, maybe a week, uh, it's not gonna happen. Nord Stream 1 has now been closed in a, in a, in a series of, uh, 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 reductions. Uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but I don't see Nord Stream 1 reopening anytime soon. Yamal used to be an important flow uh, pipeline into uh, Germany through Poland. Uh, that's been fading over the last couple of years. And now with sanctions, uh, uh, Poland against Russia, Russia against Poland, uh, that is now closed in Ukraine. This progress line is still open, still flowing. And it flows to <clears throat> Slovakia uh, and Hungary in particular, but also gets in uh, uh, into, the, into the Czech Republic and as, and as far as Germany. It David, in, could I ask a question here? It's a quick question. You know, some of these uh, uh, oceans and seas are pretty deep. Are the pipelines actually on the bottom of the ocean? Or are they propped up somehow? Because, uh, boy, some of these are several thousand feet deep. Uh, so the pressure might bust the line. Has, well, it's okay. So the the North Sea is actually quite shallow, relatively speaking, uh, a few hundred feet deep. Uh, easily manageable in terms of undersea pipelines with today's technology. Baltic Sea is very shallow. Uh, uh, laying pipe at sea is expensive. Uh, there are serious engineering, uh, but definitely manageable. Black Sea is uh, more of a challenge with uh, particularly deep uh, running upwards toward 10,000 feet deep and there's some, somewhere between seven and 10,000 feet deep. Uh, the, the Blue Stream Pipeline and the Turkish Stream both run at deep levels. Uh, and uh, the pipelines that cross the Mediterranean from Algeria uh, are at shallow depths. The deeper you go, the more expensive it is. 
uh, disrupting a pipeline, uh, it, it, it can be done, but you know, you're pretty visible on the surface doing that. And then today's satellite technology, uh, you know, the commercial level satellite technology, it's pretty hard to, uh, to do something. And certainly there's going to be uh, security coverage in that regard uh, of these pipelines. It's not so easy to break. But coming back to it here, uh, during the, the current war, this, this pipeline from, from Russia is now closed, running through the uh, Luhansk region. The Ukrainians closed this one uh, because they were saying that uh, gas was being siphoned off. Maybe, maybe not, uh, but that, that is closed. Meanwhile, this is still open. Turkish Stream is still open, flowing into southern, uh, southeastern Europe. And these flows are being maintained. Uh, if anybody ever, well, energy is politicized now, big time. Uh, it wasn't beforehand, uh, and I will move on. Algeria is an important supplier, and the Italians have really made a move in the last few months to uh, double down on their connections with Algeria, and any is moving very assertively in collaboration with Sonatrack to expand investment in an Algerian gas network. De-Russification, okay, so uh, there is the, the common view in the media is that <clears throat> Russia has, has weaponized natural gas. They have. Uh, uh, the deal is, is that Europe did that first as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of natural gas, uh, invasion of Ukraine. I mean, we just got to, this is financial people on this call and uh, you all can have your, your opinions, but finance is pretty ruthless. Mother nature is pretty ruthless. It's best to deal with the facts as they are. And uh, on May 18th, the European Union announced the plan to uh, de-Russify. They were going to eliminate natural gas from Europe's supply. In 2021, Russia supplied 155 billion cubic meters in natural gas, again, approaching somewhere between 35 and 40%, maybe closer to 40. And over time, over the to the period uh, from 2022 to 2027-30, Europe was going to import more gas uh, through LNG, other pipelines. They were going to cut gas use through electrification. They were going to produce large quantities of biomethane, which is not the case right now. Uh, I, these both biomethane and green hydrogen are basically aspirational. Uh, and it, you add that up and that's 73 uh, billion cubic meters. It's enough to power the state of California. Uh, it's a very big number. The LNG imports are, are gonna happen, but de-russification is a, is, a, is, a, is a big deal. And of course, it's all now being accelerated with pipeline closures. The plan was to for to eliminate two thirds of that gas flow in the first year, uh, this year, 2022. And that was gonna be LNG, uh, diversification to LNG. They're gonna import more. Uh, United States, basically Europe is looking to imp their change in direction. Is, is like the equivalent of the United States current LNG export capacity. It's big. The United States is going to play a role in uh, helping Europe down the road, but it's gonna take a long time. Uh, there's no snap answer. And in fact, global LNG markets have been tight as a drum uh, last year, uh, 2021, throughout the year, ranging from January's cold snap in Asia uh, through uh, the tight supply in Europe, uh, the arrival of backwardation and the disincentive to store uh, really resulted in, in soaring prices, but on a very, very tight market. 
uh, they're going to increase uh, the use of wind and solar. Well, the last year has been really lousy for the wind business in, in Europe uh, in terms of wind generation. Uh, it has been a, a significant disappointment. And for those that are looking at the, the role of renewables, uh, in fact, the natural gas is kind of a mirror for uh, the intermittency issue with, with renewables and whether that role can be filled by coal and nuclear. Uh, they're more flexible than is commonly stated. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a real challenge, but this isn't going to happen this year. Okay. Uh, behavioral change, demand destruction, conservation. Jump. Uh, so David, you, David, a question. You mentioned something a minute ago about the disincentive to store uh, natural gas, and I may have missed the stuff surrounding that. Can you say a little bit more about that? Right. So under normal market conditions, uh, spot prices today are cheaper than tomorrow. So it makes sense to uh, purchase today for storage mm -hmm. to, to okay. tomorrow. With a backwardation, it means that, that prices are higher today than they are tomorrow, and that it makes sense to sell today. Right. And right. that is a uh, recipe for draining of commercial inventories, uh, because you'd be able to, the uh, futures curve tells you you'd be able to buy it cheaper in the future. So, I mean, you look at your needs, your physical needs, or whatever you're doing in terms of hedging or, you know, uh, but uh, the backwardation is a very challenging thing uh, at a time of uh, geopolitical shortage. It certainly was inconvenient last year and, ex and accelerated, uh, intensified uh, the apparent, uh, well, the shortfall in storage, the, the difficulty that Europe had in rebuilding storage coming out of uh, winter 2020, 2021. Uh, it was a slow grind because of weather. Uh, and then at, at, at October uh, of 2021, Gazprom stopped participating in the spot market altogether. Uh, but the deal is, is that throughout the, it was just a, a never ending drama, one thing after another handicapping the ability of Europe to rebuild its storage that was mirrored by rising spot prices and then backwardation kicked in it became really really difficult to uh, store and those that had uh, uh, a long term well I'm going to move I, I really do want to move on from here Germany is the key for uh, Europe's uh, de-russification of natural gas up till this year Germany did not have any LNG import capacity. Uh, they are aggressively moving forward with this now. Uh, there are, I believe there are four uh, floating LNG facilities that will be coming online, but unfortunately not late in 2022. They're gonna be coming on in first quarter of 2023. And uh, the, the story of the post pandemic era is that uh, significant engineering projects are, are, are slow. Uh, they're late. So we'll, we'll see. But the Germans have a plan uh, to shift their supply. It's, the timing may not be exactly what they want. Globally, the impact of Europe switching from Russia pipeline gas to LNG import will have a very large impact on the global market for LNG, a major expansion, big jump. And production, uh, supply and demand were very closely matched in recent, particularly last year. Uh, new construction is slow to come online. So in fact, what Europe is gonna do is whip out that wallet and they are gonna pay the price and they are gonna outbid. Uh, there are great incentives now for East Asia, particularly China, uh, selling LNG cargoes back into the market. Uh, and part of the, their domestic demand is light because of their COVID situation, but also uh, they've got some cheap contract gas 
the picking up from the United States and also some spot cargoes cheap from Russia, and they are uh, getting those into, into Europe. But importantly, in South Asia in particular, uh, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan are basically no longer able to access the LNG markets. They're not, I mean, they can ask, but they are not receiving. And in fact, contracts have been broken. Supply contracts to Pakistan have been broken a number of times in the last months as companies were willing to pay the price, the, the break fee, if you will. And uh, the prices in Europe are so high that that uh, companies were willing to take the hit to reputation and pay the break fee. So LNG is not going to Pakistan, a country of 210 plus million people, uh, Bangladesh, big country, uh, one of those places that uh, uh, people are looking to move manufacturing out of China. Uh, Vietnam gets a lot of attention, rightfully so, but Bangladesh isn't also in a an important uh, destination for the, a lot of the lower value manufacturing, uh, uh, textiles, clothing, et cetera. Uh, but India is also getting hurt uh, by this as well. It's driven up their natural gas prices. Uh, the government is stepping in and subsidizing it so that they can maintain their fertilizer production. They need the gas, they don't have it domestically. Uh, so it's it's hitting India in, in, the, in the pocket there. Uh, and the long term is Europe is changing the direction of the global LNG market. Prices are having an impact. Uh, th this this graphic really is it's subtle. Uh, currently, the total gas demand in Europe seems to be down on the order of, of 10% and accelerating downward as prices. Uh, with spot prices, of course, are at the moon, but the contract prices, long-term contract prices are adjusting uh, as the months and quarters go by, and uh, those prices are heading uh, uh, toward uh, spot levels, if you will, uh, certainly rising from earlier prices. So the incentives are there to save. Uh, and on, really right now, the big savings are taking place on the industrial side. Uh, savings are, uh, well, this is Gazprom's look into Europe. The orange line showing a cumulative decline in exports into Europe and Gazprom's data showing a few months lag, a very steep decline in their production. As I mentioned before, uh, Russia's 60% uh, of uh, domestic uh, total energy is supplied by natural gas. Uh, they definitely uh, have a market for it. And unlike oil, which is a bit trickier with uh, uh, changing production flows, uh, fading and closing down gas wells, uh, not frack gas, but uh, old school gas is, is pretty straightforward. These are Russia's uh, production fields are monumental in size. Uh, and can be faded. Um, the Russians know what they're doing with natural gas. And other than LNG, uh, Russia's natural gas industry is a domestic industry and is not uh, substantially affected uh, by sanctions. So the en European energy price shock. Um, it began before the war as natural gas, these are household prices, okay? So there's there's so many different price points out there. So much, so many numbers get thrown around. And I just thought it would be useful to look at what the households are facing right now. Uh, and coming up to the war, it was, it was pretty serious. Now, measures have gone into place in recent months to uh, subsidize consumers, protect consumers, households in particular, but now increasingly uh, uh, companies manufacturing are getting greater attention. Electricity is also, uh, now this is uh, partly gas, uh, but it is far from just a gas story. Uh, the situation with the uh, nuclear fleet in France with about half of it offline now because uh, in particular because of a corrosion issue found in uh, 
a whole fleet of the older uh, plants, uh, same model built on a, uh, a Frenchified version of a Westinghouse design. These plants are now operating well past their originally intended lifespan. And in this old age, if you will, it turns out that uh, a corrosion problem has developed unexpectedly and most inconveniently. And France is uh, very much an importer of electricity much of the day now uh, in Europe and is depending on electricity imports from UK and from Germany. And those German gas uh, exports are generated by natural gas. So there's a bit of a uh, floor under the the decline in usage of gas in Europe, despite the prices, because of the demand for electricity in France to fill in that nuclear hole. And uh, despite the, the urging of the French government, um, EDF, to get those nuclear plants back online, uh, easier said than done. Uh, and you can say all you want to your voters, your public, but nuclear engineering is nuclear engineering, nuclear safety is nuclear safety and things will come online when they're ready. It's just maybe quite inconvenient for France and for Europe as the, as the, as the entire European electric grid becomes a dicey thing. Uh, it is heading toward uh, instability. Uh, and this, this winter is going to be a dangerous period. There's just not enough capacity uh, to move between countries it, uh, there are periods of high demand. There's also the dry weather in, the, in Norway, a big hydro producer, hydro exporter, and they're concerned about uh, exposing their population to importing high prices from the UK. Um, but they also, and they're wanting to perhaps keep some of that uh, hydropower at home to keep prices under control. Uh, the fear is around Europe that countries will go to protect their domestic populations and after the COVID experience, where in fact, that's what everybody did everywhere, despite all the talk about uh, solidarity and togetherness, and you hear about, you know, we're going to talk, we're going to have, you know, we're going to sustain cooperation with China or Russia, you know, on pandemics and climate change, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's the, the hard stuff. When, it, when push comes to shove, it's amazing. So far, still, the old traditions apply. And that is a dangerous thing for, for Europe's uh, power grid this winter. It's very, very stretched. You don't meet your 50 cycles a second. You might get it to 49 and a half, but you gotta get under that and you're gonna have to shed load or you'll lose the entire, you lose the grid. Uh, just a, a quick note here that the uh, consumers are paying higher prices, but as is often the case, uh, industrial producers pay even higher prices. And in terms of deindustrialization, that is very much a, a factor. Taking a global look here, this is from July, uh, just looking at uh, different natural gas prices across the, the world. Uh, let's just say, you know, we've gone for TTF in, in Netherlands, it's a, it's a virtual price point uh, for the uh, in natural gas industry. There are other price points in Europe, but TTF is the famous one, the primary one, I would say. Uh, let's say that it's at 60 now, but for today's discussion, we'll keep it at 50. Uh, Henry Hub is not much beyond this, maybe eight. You all could tell me where we're at today. Uh, gas is a little cheaper in Canada. Gas is very cheap in Russia, India, facing price pressures. Australia, domestic prices are quite high. JKM, the Japan, Korea marker. Uh, this part of the world, very, very uh, expensive. But as you can see, 50 is higher than anybody else. Europe will attract LNG from around the world. As much as their infrastructure can handle, they will import. So financial company, uh, energy company, financial turbulence. Energy companies, like many companies that use substantial amounts of energy or a commodity, 
hedge. They hedge against volatility. They don't want prices to go too high. They don't want prices to go too low. Well, they might like prices to go too low, but what they want to do is they want to be able to plan. They want some certainty. They want to engineer certainty. Uh, usually commodity prices are out of their hands. So they'd rather have the certainty of that aspect of their business uh, and build around it. In terms of the energy business, electricity and gas, companies sell physical commodity and they will short in the markets with the surge in pricing with, excuse me, a phone in the background, with surge in pricing, the, the shorts are deeply, deeply, deeply into the red. And the total, uh, I mean, the scale, the change in the scale of pricing, essentially a balloon has expanded tremendously. Uh, and it, it sucks up a tremendous amount of capital. And in terms of the hedging strategies, margin calls become an important factor. And $1.5 trillion in paper value of margin calls, that's a lot. <laughs> and it's beyond the uh, financial capacity of much of the energy industry in Europe. <clears throat> and they don't necessarily, you, you meet margin calls with cash uh, and you either have cash on hand or you have bank credit. And many of the biggest energy companies have maxed out their cash and credit supplies. You're welcome. And I, if you're interested in this, uh, I recommend digging into it. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. And as Europe comes to attempt to cap electricity prices, it'll be interesting to see how that affects uh, uh, margin calls, the hedging strategies, et cetera. It, while capping the prices is probably a good thing uh, in the grand scheme, because the, the ability to reduce demand is relatively in, inelastic over the, the short term and increased supply is also relatively inelastic. So you can get some crazy things with prices. So caps, there's some, some good reasons for it. It adds another layer of uncertainty and instability to an already very, very complex situation. Hey, hey David, a, a question. On, on, on this margin thing, just for me to get a sense of the size of it. Are, are you saying that 1.5 trillion is the amount of contracts on margin or it's the amount of margin calls it's, it's expected the amount, to come in? It's the amount on margin. Okay. So if, if, the, the, if the margin calls fail, you can get some very large cascades through the system where suddenly you have counterparty risk where you didn't expect it. And you really could shred uh, the energy sector with some significant feedback effects into the financial sector. Banks, uh, the, the clearing houses themselves could be a risk of failure. So while companies are selling physical product essentially forward, and it takes a while for that cash to come through. They've got these short positions that are a balance that they have to finance. Economic impacts. Okay. So these are fertilizer exporters in the world. Fertilizer being a key component of agriculture. Now, of course, now this doesn't show the domestic production. Uh, I wish I had a graphic for you, but just like grain flows 
the export flows for fertilizer are very, very, very important. And this center, you know, Russia's Russia, they've got gas. And as long as they can uh, clear through uh, uh, logistics sanctions uh, and self-sanctioning behavior abroad, they're going to be able to place their product ab abroad. They are running into problems with uh, insurance and logistics. And that's going to become a factor in the continuation of this Ukraine grain export deal. But that's another topic for another day. Europe's export position for fertilizer is in a world of trouble. And it's affecting pretty much, you know, these, these prices are, are high. Um, it's affecting everybody. And it feeds through into the agriculture sector worldwide. Uh, fertilizer prices here in the United States basically doubled last fall. And they were actually able to keep fertilizer plants open in Germany, despite the incredible prices for natural gas, historic prices at that time. They were able to keep the facilities open because the market prices for fertilizer took off higher just as much as the gas did before running into uh, market competitive resistance. So what's happening in now is across Europe, fertilizer facilities are closing or curtailing production. So far, uh, to, to summarize this rather complicated chart, it looks to me somewhere on the order of one third of fertilizer capacity in Europe is closed or is about to close. Steel facilities. This is a this is a growing thing. Uh, closing down a blast furnace is is not that hard. Restarting one is. It's a it's immensely complex. Same thing with aluminum. Uh, restarting shut smelting operations is uh, it's expensive. It's technically demanding. It's when you get, on, you know, uh, you stress the, the equipment to its max and you can get unexpected explosions and breakdowns. So um, there is real concern across the metals industry and in the fertilizer industry and in the West European pulp industry outside, say, of Finland and Sweden. There is real concern about the economic viability of those industries going forward. Why not just import from abroad? OK, it's cheaper. But that was the basis for importing natural gas from Russia, from the Soviet Union. It was cheaper. Uh, there were some political aspects to it, but it was mostly to overcome political aspects. Uh, Ostpolitik in Germany was essentially in the late 60s and early 70s was essentially when Germany came to terms with World War II. Uh, but it also, uh, the, the development of that gas flow with, with the Soviet Union was also based on mutual need, real uh, economics. But Europe is facing a, a very dangerous situation uh, where high gas prices, high energy prices are expected to continue for several years uh, going forward. Next year may be more difficult than this year, actually. Uh, so after many, many years of having these facilities shut down, uh, it's increasingly uh, unlikely that they reopen and that, that the energy cost structure in Europe has been permanently altered, substantially raised, uh, where energy intensive manufacturing is no longer competitive. So this it creates an interesting situation in terms of supply chain security. Uh, I mean, if the US government was always willing to question natural gas flows from the Soviet Union into Europe or from Russia into Europe on the basis of security. Well, Europe is in the process of outsourcing some very important components of its manufacturing and fertilizer and petrochemicals 
abroad. Uh, now, maybe you can have some uh, diverse uh, suppliers, but in terms of, uh, you know, do you really want to, uh, how much do you want to depend on the Middle East? Uh, and the United States has its own challenges with energy going forward with rising gas prices here. Uh, it, it's a complex story, but no one should assume that, that, uh, that U.S. gas exports will remain unencumbered for the next decade. We shall see. So, David, I have a question here, and that is that, you know, a couple of years ago, Donald Trump went to Angela Merkel and tried very hard to get her to start buying uh, U.S. Uh, LNG. And, uh, you know, she was pretty public in, you know, brushing them off. So, you know, had they, had they followed that, they would have been a couple of years ahead of the curve where they are now. But what do you think it is? Is it generally just the U.S. dislike for him personally, the fact that they think they're smarter guys, or what was it that they soundly, really soundly rejected that? Or did they not want to pay for the increased NATO that he kept asking them for? What, why did they brush him off so badly? And of course, in retrospect, he's not going to get credit for anything, but, you know, but I mean, it just, what, what, what was that brush off there, which would have put him a little bit ahead of the curve? Well, there's a there's a generation. There's actually two generations of American analysts that will feel they were right. Uh, so, U.S. LNG uh, is it's relatively expensive to pipeline gas. If uh, if your if your market is open, Russian pipeline gas set the price. It was the cheapest gas, the least expensive gas available, period. Uh, then came Norway and Al Algeria. LNG is always going to be more expensive because you have the liquefaction cost. Uh, think in terms of $2 per million BTU. Uh, transportation costs, another $2 uh, per million BTU. It is substantially more expensive, one. Two, the Germans did not have the infrastructure to handle importing LNG. Uh, three, Germany and Europe as a whole had made a commitment to uh, decarbonization. Uh, energy uh, Europe was planning for saying goodbye to natural gas. Uh, so the, the economics weren't there, the politics weren't there. Uh, the read from Russia, from Germany was that the situation in Ukraine uh, post Crimea and in the Donbass was manageable. Um, I, I did not expect a war. Uh, while the war has been coming for a long time, I didn't expect it. I actually expected a, a deal, um, but here we are. So, you know, 2020 hindsight is always a wonderful thing, but, you know, for not just Angela Merkel, but for the, you know, the big, uh, you know, backbone of uh, German manufacturing, especially the petrochemical industry, was what you want us to raise our costs such that we are no longer competitive with you. So there were competitive issues as well. Uh, US is pretty close to the, the cheapest, lowest cost producer of uh, petrochemicals. Well, up until the Texas freeze uh, in 2021, we're still dealing with equipment problems from that. But uh, the United States is the low cost producer for a wide variety of petrochemicals based on uh, frat gas, uh, the natural gas liquids. And what we were asking was for Germany to become less competitive. Well, okay. Running forward, uh, it, it so happens that the uh, surging price for gas in Germany is materially affecting demand, 
We just saw the closures uh, for fertilizer, for metals. Uh, there is uh, 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 switching of fuels from gas to oil, from gas to coal, uh, from gas to uh, LPG, liquid, liquefied petroleum gas, butane, propane, that's, that's going on. Uh, the pricing situation in Europe is bad. It's worst in the United Kingdom. Looking back over 50 years of what households are spending on gas and electric, uh, what's taking place starting in 2021, before the war, uh, because of the, the way markets are designed, uh, essentially marginal cost pricing, where the last plant or the last increment of supply, the, the, the price that it takes to bring that to market, that's the price that all other suppliers get. Uh, so if, if you are a renewables producer and you're in the daytime, you have very, very low costs, uh, you're, you know, the, the, the renewables, wind and solar to the degree that they're able biomass, hydro, the degree that they're able to uh, produce and deliver, they're, they are minting money right now uh, on the basis of the, uh, this uh, marginal cost pricing uh, scenario. So this, we're looking at pretty dramatic price change here. Uh, and if you're a six figure uh, income, white collar worker, well, you could probably manage it and, much, and those people in the UK will, but about a, a third of the UK population is going to get taken to the wall uh, in terms of, and I mean to the wall, and a lot of them are going to be underwater. If you were on uh, fixed income pension, uh, you're low income person, you're also dealing with rising rents there, just like here. Uh, uh, cost of living pressures are tremendous, rising costs of food uh, to, to have this dramatic and to, this is before Liz Truss, her first act is basically her first act as prime minister of the UK now was to uh, bring on this uh, bailout package. And I'll touch on that next. The, the fear uh, before Liz, prime minister Truss uh, uh, package, the fear was that as much as uh, six and 10 British factories could go under. You know, always, uh, it's uh, 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 you know, kind of talking your book. You know, uh, fear sells. Obviously, six and ten British factories were unlikely to go under, but if if two out of if twenty percent of British manufacturing goes under, that's going to be noticed uh, by shareholders, by workers, and by politicians, and. A tremendous jump in electricity already. So the UK uh, Prime Minister trusts uh, um, this bailout package, if you will, a subsidy package. Uh, over the next couple of years, somewhere between 150 and 200 billion pounds. Uh, business subsidies only will last for six months. So on the other side of this winter, Next spring, going into summer, UK business is going to be left either with a price spike or an extension in the subsidies. But this 150 to 200 billion pounds over a couple of years period, yeah, it's a big number. How big? Cut income tax to zero for an entire year. Basically, that's 25% of the total British government income, the national level income, over 9% of national income. You could cut, you could eliminate taxes on gasoline and uh, diesel. And, and pretty much everybody on this call has read one time or another or experienced the immense tax burden on liquid hydrocarbon fuels in Europe. So you could eliminate that duty entirely for eight years in the UK. That's the kind of scale that we're looking at here. It's a huge amount of money. And it's not clear how really they're gonna pay for it other than borrow. 
and prices could go higher. Uh, we'll see. Looking at things from a bit of a global perspective, this red line shows the TTF hub price in Europe. This gray line showing the JKM marker, Japan Korea marker. This lower line is Henry Hub in Louisiana. It's pretty clear how closely TTF and JKM track each other. There was a big cold snap in East Asia in January, 2021. Price spiked. In Europe, last fall, prices spiked. They spiked so high that they pulled supply out of Asia. And that's where you got that, those uh, flotillas of LNG uh, ships going from North America or reversing direction out of the Pacific. Uh, when you could make a couple hundred million dollars, you could clear a couple hundred million dollars on a cargo, a shipload of LNG. That'll get the attention of a lot of people. And if you're in a position to, you know, because of war winter's a bit on the warm side, you don't need it. Or if you're able to use domestic or imported coal or uh, oil instead of gas, you can put that LNG back on the market. But Europe and Asia are kind of in a, in a tug of war. Asia doesn't have any capacity to store. Uh, the geology in East Asia is such uh, that there's, there's, you can't, there's, there's no salt deposits, salt, you know, deep salt deposits you can hollow out for cavern storage. There are no LNG, no gas uh, fields that you can recharge. Uh, it's just that so, so the LNG uh, and gas flow in East Asia is a very close supply and demand thing, very little storage. And when it, you know, they are, their electricity in East Asia, especially Japan and Korea, uh, less so in, in, in China. For China, it's, a, it's a heating. Uh, but regardless, it, it, it's utility supply and uh, there's not a, not a lot of voluntariness to utility supply. Uh, you pay for it or not have it. And if you don't have it, you either explain it to the government or your customers why you don't have it. And a reflection of this is a surge of uh, fuel oil, refined fuel oil imports into Japan um, it also took place during the winter, but it's begun early here in August as the Japanese are fading LNG. You know, the contract supplies that, that are you know, the contracted to take delivery from the United States, uh, you could sell it on to Europe. Most large energy companies have their own in house trading outfits uh, that buy and sell. Uh, as per the interest of the parent company uh, or the, their, their mandate. And so uh, it's a factor for Japan. This is a look at the French nuclear situation. Um, 2020 is an outlier year because of the pandemic. All kinds of strange things happened and it's really hard to do any kind of stati statistical analysis based on 2020 data for anything. But looking at things now, basically the French nuclear industry is running at half capacity and it's going to go deep into the winter, perhaps even through the winter, well into 2023, perhaps longer. There's no clear answer when this resolves. A lot of talk, but engineering is engineering is engineering. We'll see. But at this point, France has become a substantial importer in Western Europe of electricity, uh, which is affecting natural gas, as I mentioned before, but it's also sub really impacting electricity flows across Europe. One thing is, that is in the process of emerging now is uh, a tax on not just fossil fuel firms, but it's also going to include renewables world. Uh, and electricity generators uh, in particular are going to be facing some big taxes to pay for these uh, capped prices. Uh, 
it's going to be an interesting to see how the details roll out. I don't have any here for you because it's not helpful to, to for this group at this point to speculate. If you have a particular interest in this, uh, get onto Reuters and get onto some of the uh, Bloomberg or get onto some of the ind industry uh, sites and you can track what's going on uh, in, in greater detail as you need. I'm going to jump through European coal, just to say that uh, Russia was a major player globally, uh, and about uh, 40, 46% of Europe's uh, imports of coal, which were very substantial as part of the whole, uh, very much a big factor for Germany, and especially Poland, which used to be a big coal miner. Uh, quality of Polish coal has been in decline for years. And it turns out that Russian coal was was a higher quality, better economic value, uh, and it's a, it's turned out to be a big shock going into this winter for Polish coal. Uh, uh, German uh, revitalization of, of coal is also being impacted by uh, the drought in Western Europe and low water levels on the Rhine. This is affecting the ability to move uh, imported coal by barge, but it also very quietly undiscussed is a, is a lifeline to the lignite uh, power generation, especially out of the eastern part of Germany uh, and all the environmental implications that that has for the air uh, in terms of you know, pollution, uh, land impacts and carbon. Uh, basically this uh, crisis in, in, in Europe, and, and it's affecting uh, globally, and we'll feel it more and more here. It's a choice between supply security and decarbonization. And I, will, I can assure you that decarbonization will come in second. Uh, and that is going to be as much as a decade uh, setback for decarbonization worldwide. Uh, you can see the that Russian thermal coal was more than 80% of the Polish market for, of imports. Uh, big factor for Germany coming to oil because this is a big deal going forward. So Russia exports not just a, a, a great deal of crude oil, somewhere on the order of 5 million barrels a day, it also exports around two and a half million barrels a day of products, oil products, uh, gasoline, diesel, heavy fuel oil. Did I mention diesel? Germany, big biggest country, biggest importer. Netherlands being a port of entry for all of uh, uh, Northwestern Europe. Uh, Poland has got it, uh, both Poland and Germany are connected to the uh, Druzhba pipeline and have large refineries that are dependent on flows from Russia. Diesel, this is going to be a big deal. Uh, there are sanctions coming on December 5th where uh, uh, Europe will embargo all seaborne tanker level, all seaborne imports of crude oil. And then on February 5th, 2023, the EU will embargo all imports of oil products, including diesel from Russia. And I don't know where they're gonna get the diesel. Uh, Russia's gonna be selling and has been selling more oil products into the Middle East where Middle Eastern producers have their own refinery infrastructure are very active in product trade worldwide and are substituting, uh, blending, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's gonna be very interesting to, to see how this all plays out against the backdrop of, ex of very tight supplies for diesel worldwide. These are crack spread spreads, uh, uh, refinery crack spreads, basically showing that the profitability for refining refined diesel is shockingly high, probably historic, although I haven't done the research to, to get you the, a concrete answer. Jet fuel is also very, very high. These middle distillates, uh, middle distillates uh, with, a, with a preference toward medium to heavy crudes because of the, the, the longer 
carbon chain molecules that you're going to get in those middle distillates. Gasoline crack spreads have gone negative in Northwest Europe and Singapore and are crashing in the US. And so gasoline prices worldwide are heading down and will continue to head down. But diesel is a big, big, big problem. And along with the embargo that uh, the European Union is planning for Russian crude oil and for products, uh, discussion has been underway for some months uh, led by the United States uh, with support from UK to put a price cap. Um, and actually the, the idea was actually floated uh, with some uh, oomph by uh, former prime minister Draghi of, of Italy, but uh, it's really gotten traction in DC. However, and the idea behind that is that uh, Russia will be paid a price for its supplies but a capped price with the intent to reduce the total income going back to Russia to reduce the resources available to fight the war today and tomorrow. Uh, however, uh, Putin says that Russia won't sell to those who sign on to uh, that price cap. It is highly questionable whether India and China will sign on to it. Uh, and it's a, it presents a very interesting situation for a uh, divide and rule, if you will, you know, uh, uh, targeting a specific countries uh, and how that is handled in the media and the markets, uh, markets being uh, certainly tending to panic these days. Uh, rather, this is not, these energy markets are not a sleepy place. Uh, you, you, could, you could throw things against the wall in a sleepy market and nobody would notice. But right now, uh, you can move a foot and somebody's going to, you know, jump a price somewhere. Hey, David, is, is that uh, likely to cause uh, Russian shipments at higher levels to India and China and then reshipment out of India and China to Europe on an expanded black market? Uh, black market, Yes. Uh, this this whole process is actually a, a massive incentive to black marketing, uh, backdoor, uh, and, and everything that comes with a black market. Uh, yeah. Whether you know what role India and China play in the development of that black market, uh, I, I I really don't see that so much. But the Indians have already. Uh, given blanket coverage to insurance out of uh, out of Dubai, I believe. Uh, to uh, it, the, the Russians have set up quite a number of trading outfits uh, recently, but they've for years they've had uh, uh, operations in Dubai. Um, they have just been scaled up substantially, and so Sovcom fought a uh, big shipping company for Russians. They are they've received blanket insurance coverage from from India, so flows to India will not be affected by the uh, the, the cap being um, kind of uh, enforced through access to insurance and shipping. Mm -hmm. it remains to be seen. Um, something on the order of two thirds of uh, liquid hydrocarbons coming out of Russia since the war began. Uh, it's increasingly on uh, upwards of two thirds are on uh, Greek owned tankers, uh, whether the Greek operations are based in Cyprus or elsewhere, but uh, it's, it's a real challenge for the Greeks and it's a challenge for the EU about how they want to handle it. Insurance is heavily uh, based in London, but it's not the only place where insurance is done. Uh, this is going to make a mess of the, if the cap, is imposed, uh, and despite what's taken place here over the last few days, no one should think that this war is going to end and end shortly. Just looking at this chart here, this is the uh, oil flows, uh, oil exports out of Russia to the EU. This is a very big number. You're looking on the order of one, two, almost three million barrels a day. Uh, they're going to have to source elsewhere or have the Russians go along with a cap. The Russians have run into to, uh, a kind of a buzzsaw of uh, 
uh, falling global oil prices anyways. Uh, you know, um, the big issue in the, in the liquid hydrocarbons world is refining capacity. It's not the availability of crude so much, uh, although that, that's, that's a long-term big issue uh, under investment uh, in fossil energy is going to be a big problem and is going to be a spanner across the knees for the renewables people because the politics are going to become so toxic. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting situation for sure. So the takeaways, for those of you who are here on the April 5th call, I want to build on the takeaways from then. Uh, are the, are the financial, this was pre-sanctions uh, on insurance and logistics or price cap. It remains to be seen just how, um, how serious this disruption could be. It turns out that there are other options for insurance. Uh, the big challenge is the availability of tankers. Uh, Russian exports to uh, Europe are on the water for a few days. The tanker uh, round trip, basically a week, <clears throat> excuse me. But a tanker going to India or uh, China, <clears throat> now, a lot of the oil flows from Russia to China come out of the East Siberia through the Russian Far East at, at Cosmino uh, or at land. Uh, through Skovorodina, but uh, going to India, for example, it's it's basically a month, and you'll need essentially four times as many tankers to move, or at least four times as much tanker capacity to move the same amount of oil. Uh, it's it's a the, the availability of tanker capacity is a real weak point in the ability of uh, Russia to play a shell game, if you will which is why I think that they're likely to play direct hardball in terms of cutoff of supplies that they're not gonna try to go along. Uh, but the falling price, the falling market price is really giving uh, the Kremlin the serious financial headwinds. The numbers come out in the last few days are quite striking. Uh, budgets have gone negative, uh, even though the current account, Russia's current account surplus remains enormous uh, because of, uh, uh, slashed imports and still strong commodity prices. Uh, a global energy shock is not just on the way, it's here and it's likely to uh, continue, if not metastasize. Coal prices in Asia are at record levels, uh, ocean-borne coal prices, uh, and it's such, to such degree that Indonesia uh, from time to time considers uh, 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 halting export flows or capping export flows, depending on what the conversation of the week is. For now, in the liquid hydrocarbons market, diesel is the weak global link. We're coming into harvest season in the northern hemisphere. Uh, diesel is uh, in almost record tight supplies in North America, yet prices are higher in Europe. They'll continue to draw diesel out of the U.S. market into Europe. And with the uh, sanctions uh, coming for February, all hell's going to break loose. I don't see any easy, I mean, I don't see anything easy coming out of this at all. So Europe's de of energy supplies will alter energy flows and prices worldwide. Done. Will drive a natural gas boom in the United States. Well, what's happened in the month since, uh, we have issues in the, in the natural gas world here. Frack gas uh, investment flows have been sluggish. The uh, shortage of uh, materials and personnel have been uh, really notable. Uh, US gas production is increasing, but only incrementally. So whatever new LNG facilities come on in the coming years, and it will take a couple of years to really ramp up. There are some projects that will come on in the next couple of years, but that, that gas take is gonna come out of the existing gas supply in the United States. And what's going to happen is US natural gas, domestic natural gas prices will rise toward European levels. Uh, and that will be a very, very unpleasant wake up call for those talking the game of energy independence 
it's not so independent after all. If you're in a traded commodity, well, you can put your own uh, export restrictions on. And a, and a, uh, uh, a energy crisis in the Northeast is, is almost assured with a cold, really bad cold snap sometime in the next couple of winters. Uh, and the politics of that are assuredly going to be toxic. But prices have already started coming up in the US uh, and it's put significant pressure on electricity prices. You can check your own utility bill wherever you are in the United States and you're gonna be higher than you were last year. Uh, so food. David, just a quick one. The, uh, it seems like energy policy is going to be a big difference whether that shock in the Northeast happens before or after the elections. If you have a cold October and people have to go and put in some more oil in the Northeast, it might make a difference in how the, how the uh, uh, politics work out. So maybe otherwise, you know, don't you think that's a big difference where it hits? Because after the election, it's too late. You know, the... if if U.S. politics were such that it were it wasn't riding on a chaotic knife's edge, we might have some basis uh, to talk. However, uh, there is governance. Uh, there are companies. There are industries. There are people. Uh, the, the entire Northeast uh, away from say, east of the Hudson River is uh, dangerously exposed uh, to demand spikes uh, for natural gas, which is the backbone of the power sector um, and for heating in the winter uh, as they've been moving away from fuel oil. <laughs> They're beginning to bring it back on. Just be assured the politics will be extraordinarily toxic uh it, it's ideology gets tossed rather quickly when one moves from what one wants to what one needs uh it's it's, yeah. uh, it's likely that the senate is going to be very very close and may in fact still end up in, in democratic hands i think it's arguable that that's the case uh we'll see in a couple of years how the how the president works but we're likely almost it's almost likely to have a split government for another another term around uh coming down here just to finish off uh, the food crisis it's complicated uh as long as fertilizer fertilizer prices are elevated because of uh, high natural gas prices uh, and uh, shifting demand flows high fertilizer prices mean that farmers economize and in low income in countries in particular, economizing means falling yields. And so you're, you're, you're not talking so much about famine, you're talking about increasing numbers of people dying in the dark or catching a, you know, a childhood diseases uh, or grandma kicks off at uh, 54 instead of 61, you know, something like that. Pandemic is still underway folks in China uh, and in fact, that, that impact on total demand of energy in China, has, their reduced demand, uh, in, oil imports are down something on the order of 400,000 barrels a day here in recent quarters, and LNG imports are in a similar situation. So this is actually helping out uh, the, the turbulence and the pressures in Europe or caused by Europe. Uh, and it's not done yet. We'll see how long the Chinese will continue their policy there. Rising prices driving tighter money. Yeah, that's going to continue. Uh, uh, let's just hope for uh, uh, some falling commodity prices here. Uh, let's just hope for that. But the demand destruction caused by high prices is translating into a recession in Europe. That's I mean, guaranteed. Uh, there is the cutting in, of industrial production based on expensive energy, but there's also cutting of industrial production because of weak final demand uh, in many places in Europe. And this will just be that weak final demand will be uh, in, uh, magnified by high prices resulting in what I see for the next decade is a significant step toward deindustrialization of high energy 
uh, economic activity. And that's not just things like metals and fertilizer, but think in terms of food production, uh, not so much grains, but think in terms of hothouses, tomatoes, peppers, uh, greens that you might have in a salad, uh, things that, uh, you know, uh, even a white collar person is going to want on their table on a regular basis. And, and it's going to be very difficult and time consuming and take time to shift supply chains uh, to adjust. Uh, and for example, in the Netherlands, uh, hothouses, agriculture is big business. Uh, and right now it's basically uneconomic. Worldwide domestic politics and geopolitics have come to center stage for business. It is now about resiliency and reliability, having replaced efficiency as the driver of supply chain management. I mean, basically that's the story here. Uh, there's more turbulence to come with, uh, with Europe's planned expansion of sanctions to affect crude oil imports and product imports in particular. Again, two and a half million barrels a day of product imports coming into Europe in addition to the 3 million barrels a day of crudes. This is a certain to bring a, a, a tough, we're looking at two or three very challenging years, even in the face of uh, uh, total energy demand cuts caused by recession. It's gonna be a tough time going forward. And where all this war ends up, who knows, but that's enough for now. Thank you. Hey, David, a, a question for you. Do you see as the December 5th uh, date approaches that there will be uh, pressure to shift that date, to move it back? I would and, be and, and that that pressure in turn could cause potential rifts in the Western Alliance? Well, that's certainly the the the, the hope, if you will, the plan from uh, from the Kremlin is to uh, sow division in the West. Right. Uh, so far, polling, uh, I've seen a number of polls, not surveys, polls uh, coming out of Germany. There's still a solid majority want to continue uh, the sanctions uh, and de uh, but that number is declining. And we have not gotten to the tough stuff yet. Uh, it's, I mean, you can check people's social media feed all, all across Europe and people have just gone back to work. It's early September, weather's still pretty nice. The hard stuff is still to come. I don't see Europe though backing away from those dates because the, the, the political cost, the credibility cost costs would be immense. There's already a great deal of division within the, the EU on, on how, uh, you know, what's going to be sanctioned and how it's going to be sanctioned. Uh, the Hungarians have gotten essentially a, a pass because they're, they're oil dependent on the Druzhba oil pipeline, as a large part of Central Europe is, all the way into Eastern Germany. Uh, and the logistics are such that you cannot reorient supply into those refineries. Uh, the German refineries, well, the, the, the German and the Polish refinery refineries can, it will take some time, but the uh, port capacity is limited and pipeline capacity is limited and the Hungarians are stuck. So the Hungarians have said, uh, have uh, used their veto position to demand a buyout and they're they're playing games with gas in Hungary uh, they're getting relatively inexpensive gas from the Russians on, on a, a, a kind of a geopolitical thing and my understanding is they have sold on a substantial part of that to their neighbors at a uh, considerable markup so. Hmm. so David first of all that's fantastic I hope you make those slides available to us because that's sure. just yeah. fantastic but uh, back in in June, we had the, our uh, Harvard Business School uh, a reunion, and uh, they had William Taylor, who was uh, mm. who talked about after the victory, Ukraine and Europe. And so, you know, he was Ukrainian ambassador at one time, and 
you know, he did just like uh, Jim Carr here, gave everybody a pretty much a chance to talk after he made the uh, presentation. But what I found, you know, pretty interesting, and ethnically I'm Ukrainian, so, but that's 120 years ago, so I have nothing in common with the guys <laughs> today, because they were, they were like serfs and, you know, they were in the Austria-Hungary Empire. But, uh, you know, what happens is that there was a, a, a lot of people that would say, hey, how about China? You know, I mean, China and an invasion of, of Taiwan in terms of just a lot of things that we need here uh, would make a huge difference. And, you know, I think uh, one comment there was, geez, the stock market probably dropped 20% the first day of the invasion. And it seems like we are historically more tied to, uh, to Europe. So are we, and, you know, you look at it and say, maybe it, there's certainly, uh, who knows if they ever invade, but, you know, there's, there's a real problem with the supply chain because, you know, they've got, uh, they can probably mm -hmm. knock out one or two of our aircraft carriers where, where they couldn't have done it before. And, uh, you know, where's our semiconductors and stuff? I, I mean, I still have my slide roll, so maybe I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> a few of you guys maybe know how to do the abacus, but it seems <laughs> like we've stripped off and put a lot of troops in the other place. We probably should have a couple of brigades and armored brigades and in Taiwan to kind of protect it. So you think maybe this is not the, the time to talk about it, but it seems like we're exposing us out by putting so much on in in the front lines in in Europe, in Eastern Europe, as opposed to maybe, you know, paying more attention to Taiwan. I actually think that so far we're the, the US is doing this on the cheap. Uh, that the the working assumption has been that Russia in DC was that Russia was a declining power and would you know, had, you know, you'd get all kinds of these uh, economic comparisons. So, you know, it's the GDP of Italy or the GDP of California, you know, and it's, it's just not, but you look in the world of commodities and Russia is, has a, a crucial, stands at a crucial uh, point in a, in a rather significant spectrum of commodities, particularly in energy and energy uh, and metals, uh, and playing word games and statistic games, uh, I think has been a, a has done a deep disservice to strategic strategic thinking in DC. Um, uh, anyone who thinks that you can remove Russia from the global uh, uh, energy scene without massive, mega historic consequences for economies all over the world. Uh, and really about half the world is like very much on the sidelines about this uh, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, many of them having also seen that this was coming for quite a while. Uh, uh, the U.S. is selling arms and making financial contributions, but NATO is not engaging in, in, in combat, and I, I don't see it getting involved in combat. Um, Russia has gone into this war with essentially a peacetime army. Uh, they have not mobilized. Uh, it has been a disaster in terms of military power projection. It's been a, just a murderous butchery uh, in terms of uh, planning and leadership and execution. And I can assure you that there are consequences for that building in Russia. Uh, especially amongst the set that wanted to see this done and wanted to see it done right. Uh, and the, the original plan was out of Moscow, out of the Kremlin, was this invasion would happen in a week and it'd be done. Well, here we are six months later and we're now having a, a, a very serious uh, break in uh, Eastern Ukraine and Russians are suffering a very, very major defeat and very public inside Russia. Uh, it's been fascinating to follow uh, uh, social media, Telegram uh, in particular. Uh, things things are not going well there. There will be consequences of this. The situation with China. Isn't it that a dictator, I mean, you respect, if you're a Russian and a Russian nationalist, you respect a, a dictator who's a winner. 
you don't respect a dictator who's losing. And it seems like uh, he's making the, Putin's making the, and I'm not talking from American point of view, we're talking about a Russian, yeah. he should have just thrown yeah. everything in it because, yeah. you know, to go in and not win or at least get some territory, it's going to be catastrophic. And maybe some strong man, even stronger man will come in. We can't assume that some weak little mousy guy is going to get take over and suddenly he's going to say, hey, man, we'll pay you reparations for the next 40 years or something like that. No, the next, uh, yeah, uh, the current regime in the Kremlin is increasingly brittle. Uh, I mean, it's substantially so. Uh, and there's been growing criticism. Uh, if you want to take, uh, get, a, get a sense of where things are headed over, say, the arc of the next five to 10 years, uh, you can read a piece by Dmitry Trenin uh, in uh, Russian International Relations. Uh, uh, if somebody wants the link, I can get it to you. But basically, the 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 this era of kleptocracy and ineffective ineffectiveness. Um, this whole current regime could be swept away, uh, and they have taken made bold moves to put it mildly uh, and execution has been murderously disastrous uh, and you're right you know the, the the Russians will go along with an authoritarian uh, dictatorship no the, the Brit of Moscow doesn't go like the Brit of Beijing it's a different culture uh, but Russians uh, appreciate uh, an authoritarian perspective uh, as long as you do the job, as long as you're effective. If you're not, we'll tell you what you want to hear. And if it's really bad, somebody will, somebody else will take your, take your spot. But your point about the uh, China uh, and the Taiwan, this is a global, we, it's a big world out there. And what's happening in East Asia, you know, what, the talk in DC is about what kind of lessons does China take away from this? Uh, well, one is that that uh, mobile defense is very effective. Will you talk to anybody in the US Navy in a position of serious responsibility and they will tell you about the tyranny of distance. And basically you're looking at three to four weeks to sail from the West Coast to the US into the Western Pacific. Two, to, two weeks at, at peak speed. A lot can happen in two, three, four weeks. Um, and the ability of the United States Navy to move logistics is so, you know, a lot of talk about defending Taiwan, a lot of talk about power projection, but the, the Chinese Navy in that region has become particularly capable. Uh, and I do think that the, the, the U.S. Is, is spread thin. Uh, I think by and large, we're looking at the world as it once was 20 years ago. And, it, and the, the deal is, is I, I don't see the Russians rolling over. I spent 30 plus years of my life in the late Soviet Union on through and a decade beforehand and studying it. Um, they are not gonna end up being the, the, the lackey of the Chinese. Uh, for those of you that read closely and carefully, you will see that there was a second wave of arrests of Russian uh, uh, technology experts that have been doing uh, collaborative work with Chinese and uh, advanced technologies. Uh, so there's a line there. Uh, the Russians are going to end up being uh, one of those multipolar points. And the Chinese have their hands full at home. They've got a, they have a real economic challenge, uh, a, a huge, you know, at least in the U.S., you know, in our housing bubble and coming into the 2007 credit crisis and 2008 recession, by and large, people lived in those houses. The Chinese property sector is uh, primarily an investment vehicle, you know, <laughs> a lot of it. And so Chinese economy is, is uh, highly vulnerable to this property investment bubble. Um, and, the, you know, the, I don't see China going from strength to strength, although it has the best, uh, the most advanced concentration of 
uh, manufacturing uh, know-how, the art of manufacturing. Is, some of it was invented in Taiwan, but in terms of a very sophisticated manufacturing e ecosystem, it's the most advanced in the world. Uh, that said, uh, the country is not moving from strength to strength. Uh, the Russians are wary of it and will cooperate to the degree they'll get really close as long as the, the, the US continues to uh, label them as the same, which is a great mistake. They're not the same. And to be effective with the substantial but a limited American power, we have to be a little more creative in our policy making abroad. And we have to be thinking, you know, India is not just waiting to fall in. India is making their own track. Uh, you read uh, uh, not just uh, the you know defense manufacturing and procurement, but all a number of other aspects of economic development for India. Uh, they're going their own way. Uh, they are going to pursue their own national interest, and it's uh, for anybody on this call that's been to India in the last five years you'll know a little bit of what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, go. Um, anyways, I'm rambling. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. David, I think I'll uh, we'll end it here. And if, and if people <laughs> want to stick around for a little bit, they can. But uh, I appreciate thank you the very, patience. No, thank you very much for uh, some great insights, a lot of information. Uh, a lot of information. Uh, appreciate it as always. Let me just uh, a couple of closing things for people. Uh, Charlotte will be sending out the uh, uh, the link to the recording as well as a copy of David's slides to everybody. Yes. Yep. Uh, Jim Carr uh, shortly, not immediately, but shortly will be sending out uh, the, the paperwork for you to get back if you want CPE credit. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. Uh, our next meeting will be just a few weeks from now. The first Tuesday, we'll be back to the first Tuesday because there's no holidays at the beginning of October. So October 4th. And uh, for at some point, probably before the end of this year, we'll look to be returning to in-person meetings. Uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But uh, so kind of keep an eye out for that down the road. Let me think what else. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks everybody for coming uh, for the, the remaining group here. Uh, obviously Here's your letter grade from my cup that I always hold in my <laughs> moderating duties. This is a great you, job, David. Yeah. Check out the slide deck. I went through a lot of stuff yeah. in a hurry. Take your time, go for what's interesting to you. But thank you all for your, your time and attention.